time when math was fun. Seriously, at least for me there was. The last time, though, I remember feeling really smart in math was when I was 10 years old. And I've always learned best when I can move beyond what I'm supposed to learn by reading in a book to actually doing what I'm supposed to learn. And when I was 10 years old, my teacher, Mrs. McCarthy, was pretty amazing because she understood this. She helped me to not only feel smart in math, but she also helped me to love math. I don't ever remember working on specific math problems in a specific math book or workbook, but what I do remember, what I remember is playing the stock market. And this is how we learn math. I learned math through doing. I learned math through projects set in real-world context. And I loved math because of this. I could see the relevance, and it all made sense. I worked with my classmates. We faced each other in class. You can see we were grouped together. And we interacted with each other. And we learned with each other. When I think back to the stock market projects we did, I remember opening up the newspaper. Right, because that's what we could open then. There was no internet in the same way to read about stocks. And I remember the smell and the feel of the newsprint. I remember feeling the excitement at discovering whether or not our predictions had come true, if we had kind of put our fake money where the stocks were going to do well. And they often did come true because Mrs. McCarthy wasn't teaching us just math. She was teaching us all kinds of subjects interweaven. She taught us culture and language and business. And this all led to solid predictions and things that pop. <laughs> it felt incredible to learn math this way. <laughs> We all learn by doing, and sometimes doing causes noise. <laughs> so I was learning math in all kinds of aspects of life in a really holistic way, and I was having fun doing it. And then the school year came to a close. It was time to say goodbye to Mrs. McCarthy, to take a two-month vacation, as you do in the US dur during uh, the school. And it was time to then go back to school after that two-month break and say hello to my new math teacher. And I vividly remember being 11 years old and in my new math class. And in my new math class, we sat in straight rows instead of small groups. And unlike Mrs. McCarthy's class, where we collaborated with fellow students, in my new class, we were only allowed to work by ourselves because anything else was cheating. And I was supposed to be learning straight out of the book. But learning really didn't happen for me out of a book. I was tested, though, on rote memory. And it was not only boring, it was totally disconnected from any real-world context. And this disconnect made math uninteresting to me. I couldn't understand why I needed to know what I was learning except to do really well in class. And doing really well in class was never really a goal for me. Sure, I did well, or well enough, but what I really wanted to do was learn. So I found myself managing my schoolwork in a way that allowed me to learn. And that meant learning outside of classroom experiences. Because those are the experiences that felt real, and meaningful to me. So basically, I was designing my own educational system because the design of the traditional standard educational school system often didn't work for me. And although I had some decent teachers throughout my required education, it would take me until I was in my late teens and early 20s in my undergraduate and graduate programs to meet other educators like Mrs. McCarthy. Those educators who helped me to love learning, even within a traditional education system. 
And they were able to do this not because they were working within that traditional education system, but because they were learning how to work around it. And it wouldn't be until I was in my 30s and earning my doctorate till I would understand why I loved to learn what I loved. Good news for all of us in this room, design matters. And it doesn't just matter in creating educational systems, and it doesn't just matter to us designers. We are in a time and a place where vice presidents and people that are in the C-suite sit around conference tables with their iPads, wondering why their products aren't as delightful to use as their competitors. And these folks now have an understanding that design is not only a differentiator, but a necessity. A necessity for their business to not only survive, but to thrive. And even though these folks might not really understand what we do as designers, and they might think of it as magic, magic or some kind of secret sauce, what they have begun to understand is that design matters, and they need us designers to make their companies, organizations, and products relevant. So vice presidents now realize that design is life for their companies, and so their company's life needs to be centered on design. This understanding has led to an increase in demand in designers. And even more specifically, it's led to an increase in demand of user experience designers. In the United States alone, there are around 150,000 job listings for UX folks. And new graduates aren't prepared for these jobs. And that's a huge number, right? It's only growing because people's understand, understanding that design is part of the business solution, that's growing. Technology moves fast, academia doesn't. I made this statement in 2009, and it's still as true as ever. And what has become more and more apparent over the past few years is that industry moves fast and academia doesn't. This has led to an enormous skills gap between what students learn and what industry needs. And this gap has created a critical state. Most graduates aren't graduating with the skills they need to be hired. So companies are left with a tough choice. Don't fill the job openings they have, hire unprepared employees and hope they can bring them up to speed, or spend lots of money acquiring teams of designers that have already proven they can successfully bring a product to market. It's hard. It's hard to hire new designers. It's hard to work with unprepared design colleagues. And it's hard to learn the skills to keep up to date in the world of design. Basically, it's hard to hire the right talent, and it's equally as hard to be the right talent. Design plays a critical role in the success of companies, and hiring managers now know this. And they know this because what has been seen cannot be unseen. And what has been seen are companies like Apple, who have invested a lot of resources into design. And all we have to do is look at Apple's profits compared to other companies, and we realize how much design matters. So not filling open positions is just not practical. It's not an acceptable solution for companies. So if you're a large company and have the resources to do so, you can create an internal school to create your own designers. We see IBM doing this right now. In the next five years or so, they plan to hire five or, five or 600 UX people. And they know they're not going to be able to find the talent. So instead of just searching and searching and searching, they've created their own internal school. It's kind of like a six-month boot camp for UX people. And these kind of programs have been necessary because it's really challenging 
to find people with the holistic skill set needed to perform well in our industries. Or maybe if you're a large company, say the size of Facebook, and you need talent right away, you can go the Instagram route, where you go ahead and spend $1 billion for an app, even though you already have a bunch of photo apps, because $1 billion buys you talent, and talent that's already proven they can take a product successfully to market. And it's less expensive to spend $1 billion to than to try to find, hire, and train a team. This is kind of crazy. When we talk to hiring managers, they tell us that hiring can be scary because it's hard to know what you're going to get in a new hire. But it really doesn't have to be. See, companies want to hire people who have a good cultural fit, that get along with the existing team. Hiring managers tell us we need people who get us, and we need people who get our process. Hiring managers need talented folks who can jump in at any time of a project to get whatever needs to be done within the project. So they're looking for a good cultural fit and people who have the right skills. And the right skills are a mix of technical hard skills and soft interpersonal skills. Companies know that designers and developers, UX folks, we're all a part of the business solution now. And the bottom line is experience sells. But these companies struggle to find the talent that have the right experience to craft the right experience for their customers. So they resort to spending a lot of resources to recruit and train a team. <coughs> so we asked hiring managers this question. What skills do good designers have? And across the board, they said the same thing. They said, experienced designers, they need to be proficient in a lot of things, including information architecture, copywriting, design process management, user research practices, interaction design, information design, visual design, and editing and curating. They went on to say, that good designers need to have a great understanding in things like ethnography, domain knowledge, business knowledge, analytics, what the heck do we do with all this data we've been collecting, um, marketing and technology and return on investment and, use, and social networks and use cases and agile methods. This is what hiring managers are looking for in a good designer. But we asked a follow-up question. We asked, what separates out the best designers? And they hire managers, they tend to look at each other, and they say, OK, of course, of course, the best designers must have all of the same skills a good designer has, but they need to have soft skills, soft skills like storytelling, and critiquing, and sketching, and presenting, and facilitating. This is what creates the best designers. This is a lot to know. And this is really hard to find in a person. And this is why we think of experienced designers also as unicorns. They're magical, mystical. We know they're probably out there somewhere. If we search long and hard enough, maybe we can find them. And however you arrive, however you arrive at being a unicorn is OK. You just need to get there. So a specialist, a specialist is someone who has more experience in one area over others. A compartmentalist is someone who has experience in only one area. And a generalist, other known as, otherwise known as a unicorn, is someone who has equal experience in most areas. And here's the thing. Most hiring companies can't afford specialists 
desire generalist, and will die with compartmentalist. It's very challenging for teams to function when they are only built with specialists and compartmentalists, because only specific people can do specific tasks at specific times. And this becomes a real problem when a team member gets sick, goes on vacation, or leaves the team altogether. The team is then left asking who, who takes on their task. And when life events such as these occur, projects get bottlenecked. And sometimes projects completely stall or fail. Also, in a work environment where there's only specialist and compartmentalist, during the life cycle of a project, there are often times when some members of the team sit completely idle, while other team members are having to work really hard and pull extra hours. This doesn't lead to good team flow. However, when a team is made up of generalists, bottlenecking and idling is less likely to happen because team members are able to perform any and all of the tasks to make sure a project gets done. So good team flow happens when a team is made of generalists who can keep a project going no matter what. For most of us in this room. Our goal is to be on or lead a team with other amazing designers to produce appropriate and awesome design solutions. But what I'm suggesting our goal should be is to be or be on or lead a team with other amazing generalists to produce appropriate and awesome design solutions. As I said earlier. Companies need design and designers not to survive but to thrive. But in our reality today, companies need generalists not to survive but to thrive. And in general, our schools don't create the type of generalist companies need. Understanding how expectations in the workplace have changed is important. It's important because we need to make sure that education helps build. The graduates to meet the expectations of industry, and this isn't just important to companies. It's important to graduates who want to go out and be productive members of society to have meaningful jobs. So, how do we create more generalists? We do this by bridging the skills gap between education and industry. But before we can bridge the gap, it's really important that we understand the gap itself. So let's get schooled. I sometimes ask myself this question: How on earth did we get here? And the reality is, we got here by design. So let's look at the U.S. education system for a moment. We do a lot of things right in the U.S., like create sugary, caffeinated, fizzy drinks. Um, make super oversized hamburgers, some of my favorite, and create spectacular over-the-top experiences. But what we don't get right, we don't get it right when it comes to educating our citizens. Our educational systems are a bit broken, and we haven't really updated them years, or in decades, or a century. Our models and our structure of education are heavily based on outdated developmental theories and medical concerns. Ever wonder why schools in the U.S. and around the world get two or more months for vacation when we in the professional world work all year round? I did, and what I found is that this is actually based on outdated thinking. We actually have to travel back in time, like get in our time machines, to figure this out. To go to the mid and late 1800s, when doctors thought that students might be too mentally and physically frail to attend school all year round, kind of seems crazy now. But that's what the thinking was, and also during this time. Oftentimes in the cities, it was really hot, and the schools were very poorly in,、uh, ventilated. And so doctors and other people decided that、uh, there was concern to have、uh, have schools open during this heat of the summer because it could be a breeding ground for disease. 
And then because the cities were so hot in the summertime, the wealthiest people that lived in cities, they left to their vacation homes during the summer. And when they left, they took their kids with them, and the kids were no longer enrolled in school, and school cost a lot to, to put on all year round. And because the wealthiest people with the school system in the summer, so people started to ask, why bother? Why even bother having school in the summertime? And this is just one part of one example of how we, well, our ancestors, how they created a system that worked for them then, but this is now, and these systems aren't working for us now. For example, we now have air conditioning or well-ventilated uh, school buildings in most developed countries with developed school systems. Diseases don't quite run rampant in the same way as they once did. But we are still held hostage to the decisions that were made more than a century ago. And now we have all sorts of research that shows students have a significant loss of learning when they take extended breaks from school. Another design decision, a decision that was designed for educational school systems, are standardized tests. And standardized tests are the exact same test given the exact same way to individual different students. They're tested on the exact same subjects, no matter what their past experience has been. Standardized testing as we know it showed up in the late 19th century, and each country that uses standardized test testing, which is most developed countries, has a unique relationship to it. Students are often taught what to learn, but they are rarely taught how to learn. And instead of preparing students to be lifelong learners, to ask questions, to be curious, students are taught to take tests. Their education tends to focus on the best outcome, which are defined by the school systems. And the best outcome for most school systems are for students to excel on the standardized test. In the US, standardized tests are linked to funding and support. If students do not excel on standardized tests, schools lose the resources they desperately need to stay afloat. And this tension causes the focus to be on teaching to the test. Because what gets tested is what gets taught. Another example of the industrial age affecting our school systems is the lack of collaboration that students have with each other. Just like workers on a manufacturing assembly line, workers or students work by themselves one task at a time, and they rarely interact with their classmates. Because students are tested as individuals, they are taught as individuals. We see students only being taught to work by themselves. We can see this in the furniture of classrooms. When individual chairs are set up to face the front of the classroom, students walk into the classroom knowing knowing they are going to be working by themselves as individuals, facing the stage, facing frontwards to their instructor, the sage on stage. Students know they'll be working by themselves on routine problems that can be learned and mastered through memorization. We train students to work about half the year, to memorize things and not think for themselves. We train them to work by themselves, and then, and then we expect them to be able to work a full year, to solve out-of-the-box, non-routine problems, and to collaborate as a team member in a professional environment. And we wonder why we don't have the talent we need to really move our industry forward. Currently, there are many learning paths to choose from, and I bet if we talk about this later tonight, most of us have experienced a combination of these. There's a self-taught, thrown into the deep end path, which so many of us room have had to do, because this is the only way we were gonna be able to learn any of this. Um, and this path has been great for promoting lifelong learning. 
but it can often leave us wondering, what are we still missing? What don't we know that we need to know? There are short programs and workshops and conferences, and this path is great for a quick injection of knowledge and inspiration, but it often leaves us wanting more, wanting more tools and resources and learning opportunities. There's the online courses and training path that is really great for learning technical skills. And it allows us to learn at our own pace, at our own schedule. But it often lacks in the ability to help us hone our soft interpersonal skills. There's the university path, which is great for a broad general, generalized education. And it often gives turner, uh, learners the time to really understand their place within a larger world, within that kind of context. But the structure of getting course changes approved through most university systems is really challenging and can take years. And the lack of continuing educational support for professors, well, it would scare you to death if you knew how little professors were supported in learning, continuing their learning. The resource, resources are just not there. So this often puts course materials years behind where our profession is. There's the traditional design school path that often produces time for experimentation that leads to a really polished portfolio. But graduates often leave school not being able to speak with hiring managers about things like project constraints and real world concerns. So I've been thinking about this question a lot. Where do we go from here? We think there needs to be some place where learners can help nurture their inner unicorn. That's why Jared Spool and I, we've been working on a project that we call the Unicorn Institute. And we're researching and building new pathways to careers in UX. We've been asking questions like, what if there was a school created specifically for user experience designers? And what if this school focused specifically on making generalists? I want to delve further into traditional design schools for a moment, because when Jared and I talk about the Unicorn Institute with people, people often ask us, what's the difference between traditional design school and the type of learning environment we think needs to exist to meet the needs of both learners and hiring companies today and in the future. And the best way we found to answer this question is by asking a few more questions. So often, and this is not, this is broad generalization, but often traditional design schools focus on rock stars. But we wondered, what if we focused on creating really amazing junior designers? Traditional design schools often focus on thinking but what if we focused on making by building and deploying? Traditional design schools often focus on individual work, but what if we focused on collaborative work? Traditional design schools often focus on constraint-free projects, those green field, blue sky kind of projects. But what if we focused on real world projects? Traditional design schools often focus on technical schools, uh, skills, but what if we focused on soft skills? And I appreciate design school. That's where I got my start in higher education. But I really had to work hard to create a learning opportunity that embraced real-world constraints, real-world processes, and real-world expectations. So beyond these two questions, what if there was a school created specific, specifically for user experience designers, and what if it focused on making generalists? Jared and I asked this question. What if we turn school structure on its head? How could we create a program that allowed students to have time to learn? Could we, for example, have courses be three weeks long and only one course at a time, where the course met during what we would consider work hours, if there's such a thing within what we do, 
And this three-week course, could it continue to be all year round with only time off for holidays and short breaks so students didn't have a loss of learning? Could we be able to connect industry with education by having two-day workshops that were given by industry experts, those people that we come to conferences to, to hear speak, that we read the books of and articles of, could we have those people come in and work with our students? And could the next three days of that course be individual mastery, mastery projects, projects that facilitators, not just teachers, but facilitators, people who help students really connect what they were learning? Could they create specific individual projects that students will work on their own um, to really make sure they master the skills that they just learned in the workshop? Because it's important to have individual mastery if you're going to spend the next 10 days on a team project. And what if these team projects came from real world clients and had real world constraints? And what if these courses with their three week chunks actually took this project at two weeks and put it over three to five month period, really flip the structure of school around? Could that create the time for real world expectations? Could meeting during those normal hours give students an opportunity to really build their stamina as a professional? And what if instead of teaching to the test, we decided to teach to learn? Could students learn technical and soft skills that they needed to survive and thrive when they, needed, when they left the classroom? And we thought in order for this to happen, we really needed to have a goal change, a goal change from teaching to learning. And in this learning environment, there could be a shift from standardized testing to project-based learning. Students could be encouraged to focus on learning and experiences instead of focusing on grades. And I've seen this shift happen firsthand. These are two of my former students, and they were working on a real-life project for a real-life uh, client, which was to create a very in-depth animation that opened up a conference for professional designers. No pressure design students. Um, but however, when we arrived at the, at the event, we were there and 20 minutes before, the students realized that there had been a problem with the software and the hardware and it wasn't their fault. But they realized immediately that they needed to create a workaround in 20 minutes for the project that they've been working on for weeks. In those 20 minutes, the students weren't thinking about their grades. What they were thinking about was meeting the expectations of the clients. And when students start thinking in this way, they work harder. They work harder for clients than they would ever work for themselves. Because when they're working for themselves, they're just managing grades. They're just managing their time. But when they're working for clients, they're managing other people's expectations. And that's way more meaningful for most students. So maybe in this learning environment, there would be a focus on project-based experiential learning, on real-world projects. Because when, uh, when courses and projects, they're all project-based, the roles of students change. Students move from individuals to collaborators. They move from seeing their role as independent to interdependent. Students turn their focus from individual grades to doing what's best for the project and for the team. And that's what we need when these students come into our worlds in the professional landscape. Project-based learning encourages students to stop receiving information passively and instead be the constructors of their knowledge. They no longer take tests. They take on challenges. And this learning environment could be structured in a different way, where 75% of students' time was project-based, where students would work with stakeholders and developers, where designs would get built and deployed. And maybe 
There could be multiple three-month projects, enough for two years of general education, enough to create portfolios that were not only pristine or perfect, but portfolios that were filled with experiences where when we're being that role of hiring manager or hiring other people for our team, we could really ask these recent graduates to speak to their experiences in depth. That would help graduates be able to show what they've actually learned and what they actually did. And it would help hiring managers know who has the skills that they need to be on their team. What if instead of focusing on individual learning, this learning environment focused on individualized learning with learning opportunities crafted specifically for them and opportunities to practice their skills through collaboration. There could be a role change, a role change from teachers to facilitators. So these facilitators of learning, they're no longer the all-knowing instructor, the sage on stage. Instead, they become a resource. And as a facilitator, they're able to move away from just the art of teaching to the art of connecting. Facilitators are able to focus on being what each individual student needs him or her to be. And they serve roles such as counselor and education optimizer, communicator, project leader, and learning coach. This new learning environment could change the structure from teacher-directed activities to student-directed activities, where teachers don't just assign the work to students, but instead work with the students to determine project constraints and tasks. And instead of a solo learning environment, what if there was a team learning environment? This is more like the workplaces that we tend to see, especially when we're working, crunching on a project at the, the last minute, or, or brainstorming together, or just finding that energy that comes with moving chairs from individual straight rows to coming together. And maybe students could work together and collaborate to develop solutions to challenging problems. And what if instead of routine problems that are mastered through memorization, students focused on non-routine problems? Because in our age of knowledge and information, we need students and we need workers who are able to solve challenging, non-routine problems. The kind of problems that most of us in this room face every single day. Let's bring that into the classroom. Because experiential learning allows students to get an idea of various aspects of design, to work on design process management, to create professional level work, to hone communication skills, to learn how to listen to clients, to make connections with professionals, to have the opportunity to collaborate, and to learn leadership skills. There are many reasons why experiential and project-based learning is the best way for many students to learn. And I had the opportunity to learn all of these firsthand when I was 10 years old and in Mrs. McCarthy's math class. Through those experiential learning opportunities by playing the stock market, I got a sense of these types of things. So math was fun. Well, actually what was really fun was learning. Learning was fun. Because at 10 years old, Mrs. McCarthy wasn't just my teacher. She was my facilitator of learning. And that's exactly what I needed to have a transformative learning experience. Mrs. McCarthy was able to focus on individualized learning. And she did something pretty remarkable in her classroom. She not only made her students excited about learning, but she also engaged us as active participants in our own learning experiences. We need more facilitators of learning. We need more people who can help students to become industry ready. And we need our educational systems to support these types of people. But how do we teach students to be industry ready? 
Educators face many challenges when attempting to teach students how to be industry ready. For example, it's way easier to grade hard skills than it is to grade soft skills. And in academia, as we know, what gets graded is what gets valued, and what gets valued is what gets taught. This challenge doesn't so much have to do with the lack of passion of educators, because in most cases, that's there. What it has to do is with educational systems and governances and funding opportunities. These types of challenges occur because the focus of our educational systems tends to be on teaching and not on learning. Keeping this in mind, I suggest instead of asking how do we teach students to be industry ready, we ask how do students learn to be industry ready? This is the question that great facilitators ask. This is how they get students not only excited about learning, but also engaged in the learning process as active participants. When we change the question, we shift the focus from teaching to learning. And that's exactly where the focus needs to be. We know that people learn by making, by building, and by deploying. Humans have known this since the time of Aristotle when he said, what we have to learn to do, we learn by doing. And one of our goals with the Unicorn Institute project is to understand how to make industry-ready graduates. Figuring out exactly how we support students learning through doing, that's industries and education's challenge to figure out. And we need to figure it out together. So Jared and I are excited to dive deep into these challenges and to work to find solutions that support students and hiring companies. And even though we're working on this, we know that this challenge is going to take all of us working on finding solutions to really bridge the gap between industry and education. And it's critical be that we do so because the right education is the key to moving our industry forward. Many smart folks say we live in the knowledge age, but what we really live in is the experience age. We know that experience matters. It matters in the products, in the websites, in the apps, in the software we all design. And guess what? Experience matters in education, in learning. And the experience in learning design needs to change. And it's up to all of us to change it. It's up to us to invest the resources into the next generation of designers, developers, and UX folks and generalists. It's up to us to work together both in education and in industry, to solve this challenge. It's up to us to approach it in many different ways, including shoring up the school educational systems we have now and creating new learning opportunities that really meet the, the needs of both learners and industry. It's up to us to build by developing skill sets of our future employees, our future coworkers, and even ourselves. It's up to us to design our industry's education. Thank you. Go forth and make awesomeness. Thank you.